So this video is going to be on section um, 6.1 on the standard normal distribution. Um, so by the end of chapter six, you should be able to recognize the normal probability distribution and apply it appropriately. You should be able to recognize the standard normal probability distribution and apply that appropriately and compare normal probabilities by converting to the standard normal distribution. So some vocabulary, some of these words we've seen before, some of these terms. Um, so in chapter five, we were introduced to continuous random variables. And those are just variables which take on infinite number of possible values. These are usually measurements, things like height, weight, the amount of sugar in an orange, the time required to run a mile. So instead of counting something, we're measuring it so we can have all the values in between the whole numbers as well as the whole numbers. So the normal distribution, that's a continuous symmetric bell-shaped distribution of a continuous random variable. We've seen symmetric distributions before when the data values are evenly distributed about the mean. So we can have unimodal data or sometimes we have bimodal data, but either way you can fold it in half and you get those mirror images of each side. A left skewed distribution, which might also be called negatively skewed, that's when the majority of the data values fall to the right of the mean, so on the smaller end. A right skewed distribution, positively skewed, that's when the majority of the data values fall to the left of the mean, so when they're bigger. A z-score, we've seen this before as well. So the formula is the z-score equals the value minus mu, the mean, divided by sigma, the standard deviation. And that's the number of standard deviations between the measurement x that we're talking about and the mean mu of that distribution. And the standard normal distribution is a normal distribution, but the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So we'll see lots of different normal distributions with different means and standard deviations. But when we talk about the standard normal distribution, um, then we mean the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So um, there's a YouTube video here, um, and it's the StatQuest YouTube video on the normal distribution. Um, I know if you're watching the video, you can't click on that, but you can go to YouTube and Google, well, search in YouTube, StatQuest normal distribution. There's lots of good videos out there um, that show or talk about the normal distribution. So this is a five minute one that I think does a good job, but it's gonna just go over the things we're gonna talk about um, in this video as well. But we, um, we talk about the normal distribution because it's a very important continuous probability distribution. So it's bell shaped. So you can see from that graph that I was just trying to move my face kind of out of the way of, um, you know, it's bell shaped. So it has this curve to it kind of looks like a bell. Um, and we see it in all kinds of disciplines, psychology, business, econ, sciences, nursing, and of course, in math. Um, so one example is that some instructors use the normal curve or normal distribution to help determine grades. And that's what we mean by grading on a curve. IQ scores are also normally distributed and often real estate prices fit a normal distribution. So just examples where we see it um, out in the real world. Um, it's really important, but it doesn't fit everything in the real world. And that's something to keep in mind. We're gonna see situations um, where it doesn't, but we still can use it even sometimes when something isn't normally distributed, we'll find out in chapter seven other cases where we can use that. Um, so the normal distribution has two parameters, which are two numerical descriptive measures, the mean mu and the standard deviation sigma. So if X is a quantity, quantity to be measured that has a normal distribution with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, we write it this way. We've seen this before, so X tilde n, so x is a random variable with a normal distribution with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. Um, and then we've also sort of talked about this before, the cumulative distribution function is p of x is less than x. So this is the variable that we describe in words and the little x are the values it can take on. So this red line sort of describes um, the sort of what happens as you go to infinity um, with these little bars get smaller and smaller. This looks a lot like our binomial distribution or a discrete distribution. Um, and it just sort of shows the connection between the two. So a normal curve is bell shaped. 
Here we have um, it drawn with the mean in the middle, and then you can see one standard deviation to the right of the mean, two standard deviations to the right of the mean, three standard deviations. And then on the other side, these are below the mean, so we represent them with a negative z-score essentially, um, but it's symmetric around the mean. It has a mean, median, and mode that are theoretically equal and located at the center of the distribution right here. It's unimodal. It's continuous. It approaches but never touches the x-axis. So this blue line comes down, looks like it might touch the x-axis, but it technically doesn't. The total area under the curve is equal to 1 or 100%. Um, and the portion of the area under the curve and to the left of some given value represents the probability that a measurement will lie in that interval. And we're going to see examples of that um, with images that'll make that a little bit easier to visualize. To find the probability to the right of a given value, we're going to subtract the area to the left of the given value from one. So if the whole area underneath is equal to one, then if we're looking at less than a certain value, then we just go ahead and we just do that one the way we are used to doing it. If we're looking for the greater than probabilities, we subtract the less than probabilities from one. And again, we're going to see examples of that. Um, so the normal distribution depends only on our mean mu and our standard deviation sigma. So what that means is that um, since the area under the curve has to equal one, any change in the standard deviation is going to cause a change in the shape of the curve. So if the sigma, if our standard deviation is small, we'll have a narrower curve. And if it's bigger, we'll have a wider, flatter curve. Um, a change in mu changes um, the graph to shift left or right. So that's where that peak is. And so if you have a bigger mean, it's going to move to the uh, right to be bigger. And if it's a smaller number, it'll move to the left. And then again, the height will depend on our standard deviation. A smaller standard deviation, we get a taller, narrower curve. And a bigger standard deviation, we get a shorter, wider curve. So that means there's an infinite number of these normal probability distributions. You can see in this picture, we have a couple of different versions, with all with the same mean, because they all have the same peak, but different widths and heights. So because there's so many different possibilities here, um, one that we use a lot is the standard normal distribution. Um, and the standard normal distribution is a normal distribution of standardized values called our z-scores. Um, so a z-score we know is measured in units of the standard deviation. Here's a picture of that standard normal curve with our mean of zero. And then each standard deviation is marked here. So here's one sigma, two sigma, three sigma. This is our standard normal curve. So if, um, if the mean of a normal distribution is five and the standard deviation is two, then the value 11 is three standard deviations above or to the right of the mean. Um, and the way we calculate that is here with our z-score formula. So here's our x value of 11 minus 5 divided by 2, and that equals 3. So our z-score for the value 11 is 3. So that would be over here. Um, so again, standard normal curve, we have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1 because it's actually just that curve of the, all those z-scores. And this, we call this the transformation, gives us this distribution. Z is a random variable with a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So the value X in the above equation comes from a normal distribution with a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma. So you can go back and forth from um, maybe some data that you've collected that has its own mean of mu and its own standard deviation of sigma, and you can transform it into the standard normal distribution um, by using the z-scores. So the z-scores tell you um, how many standard deviations the value x is above, which is to the right of um, the mean or below to the left of the mean. Um, values of X that are larger have positive Z-scores, and values that are less than the mean, smaller than the mean, have negative Z-scores. And if X equals the mean, then X has a Z-score of zero. 
So we can also work backwards if we know the z-score. So if this is our finding the z-score formula, if we multiply both sides of this equation by sigma and add mu to it, we get this equation here. So some value x would be equal to its z-score times the standard deviation plus the mean. So obviously we would need to know all those things to be able to calculate the value, but we often have that information. So here's our first example. Suppose x is a random variable with a normal distribution with a mean of mu and a sigma of 6, mean of mu, a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 6. This says that, um, so we just said that, and then suppose x equals 17. Then to calculate the z-score, we use the z-score formula, 17 minus 5 divided by 6 equals 2. So that means that 17 is two standard deviations above or to the right of the mean mu5. That means it's bigger than the mean because it's positive. So if we let x equal 1, then this z-score, same formula, 1 minus 5 divided by 6, we get negative 0.67. So we know that x, that 1, is 0.67 standard deviations below or to the left of the mean. Okay, So if I am given a z-score and I know that it's, and it's positive, I know we're to the right of the mean. And if it's negative, it's below the mean. It's to the left of the mean. It's less than the mean. So what is the z-score of x when x equals 1? And then here's a different um, distribution. x is a random variable with a normal distribution with a mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 3. So 1, that's our value here, minus 12, our mu, divided by sigma of 3, and we get negative 3.67. Now remember, you can do these in Excel. If you do, you want to make sure you parenthesize that numerator. Um, otherwise, you would divide 12 by 3 and then subtract 4 from 1, and you get a different number here, and that would be no good. So always put parentheses around your numerators, even your denominators, if you're doing any addition or subtraction in the numerator or denominator. Um, and the z-scores really help us compare things that are scaled differently. So if we have two distributions that have different means and standard deviations, but we convert them both to the z-scores, then we can say, you know, one is you know, a lot bigger than its mean or it's less than its mean, and it just helps us compare things. So what is our x value if we know that our z-score is 2? So still, same distribution up here, so we know the mean and the standard deviation. So now we use this version of the formula, and we take the z-score, which is 2, times our standard deviation of 3, and then we add on our mean of 12, and we get 18. So our value x, oops, I thought there'd be one more thing there, um, the data value is 18. So the heights of the 430 NBA players were listed on team rosters at the start of the 2005-2006 season. The heights of basketball players have an approximate normal distribution with a mean mu equals 79 inches and a standard deviation sigma equals 3.89 inches. For each of the following heights, we're going to calculate the z-score and interpret it using complete sentences. So 77 inches and 85 inches. And then um, we're going to ask the question, if an NBA player reported his height has a Z, had a Z-score of 3.5, would you believe him? So I'm going to move my face out of the way. So to get the Z-score for 77, we take 77, we subtract off the mean of 79, and we divide by the standard deviation, trying not to be in the way, of 3.89 and we get negative 0.51. So 77 inches is 0.51 standard deviations below our mean of 79 inches. So an NBA player who was 77 inches tall is actually shorter than the mean NBA player. Um, and 72 inches is six feet, so 77 is six feet five inches tall, and that person is still considered short. For 85 inches, we do the same steps. So we take our value 85, we subtract off the mean of 79, and we divide by our standard deviation of 3.89, and we get 1.54. So 85 inches is 1.54 standard deviations above our mean of 79 inches. So that is a player who is taller 
than the mean um, NBA player. And then if an NBA player reported his height had a Z-score of 3.5, would you believe him? So now we're going to work backward to see how tall this person is. Um, so I said it's very unlikely because if we do 3.5 times 3.89, our standard deviation, plus our mean of 79, we get uh, 92.62 inches tall, and that is 7 feet 8.6 inches tall. So we have another example here um, in section 6.1 on the normal distribution. So the mean height of 15 to 18 year old males from Chile from 2009 to 2010 was 170 centimeters with a standard deviation of 6.28. Male heights are known to follow a normal distribution. So let's let X be the height of a 15 to 18 year old male from Chile in 2009 to 2010. Then X is a normally distributed variable with a mean of 170 and a standard deviation of 6.28. So suppose a 15 to 18 year old male from Chile was 176 centimeters tall. What is the Z-score? So we're gonna use that Z-score formula again, um, X minus mu divided by sigma. So we're gonna have 176 minus 170 divided by 6.28, and we get 0.96. So what this means is that the Z-score tells us that X equals 176 centimeters is, 0.96 standard deviations to the right of the mean of 170 centimeters. So again, that positive z-score tells us it's going to be to the right of the mean. It's bigger than the mean. Now you can see that um, from the 176 knowing that the mean is 170, uh, but sometimes you just get the z-score and that positive or negative value gives you information. So suppose that the height of a 15 to 18 year old male from Chile from 2009 to 2010 has a z-score of negative two. So first off, we know that it's going to be to the left of the mean, it's smaller than the mean. But we can figure out the height by using the other formula. So we're gonna take the z-score times the standard deviation plus the mean. So negative two times 6.28 plus 170, and we get a value of 157.44 centimeters. So that's how tall that male was. Oh, look, I didn't do my animations correctly. Um, so if X is a random variable and has a normal distribution with a mean mu and a standard deviation of sigma, then the empirical rule states the following. I'm gonna just click through until we get the graph so that doesn't look as silly. Um, so about 68% of the X values lie within one standard deviation of the mean. So those Z scores are um, plus one and minus one. And you can see on the graph, those are represented here in this green section. We've seen the empirical rule in this graph before. Um, about 95% of the X values lie within two standard deviations of the mean. So the Z scores are plus two and minus two. So that's represented by the green and the yellow. So the yellow brings us out to that full 95.4%. Um, and then about 99.7% of the values lie within three standard deviations of the mean. And I think I said before that it was 99, but it's really 99.7. So almost all of our X values lie within three standard deviations of the mean. And those Z scores are plus three to N negative three. Um, so sometimes this is referred to as the 68, 95, 99 rule or 99.7 rule. Um, we can use the empirical rule to solve some problems. So suppose X has a normal distribution with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of six. So we know that 68% of the X values lie within one standard deviation of the mean. So if we take that standard deviation of six and multiply it by negative one, that's negative six. And if we take that one and multiply it by the standard deviation of six, we get positive six. So that's our sort of um, bracket or range for one standard deviation away from our mean. So if we subtract that six from our mean of 50, we get 44. If we add that six on, we get 56. So we know that 68% um, of our values lie between 44 and 56. So between um, negative one and positive one standard deviations away from our mean. 
Now, 95% of our values lie within two standard deviations away from our mean. So same thing, we take the negative two times six and get the negative 12, and we do positive two times six to get positive 12, and we add and subtract those from our mean. So if we subtract it, we are gonna get 38. So 50 minus 12 gives us 38. Add it on, 50 plus 12, we get 62. So 95% of our values lie between 38 and 62. You can also take the numbers you got before, 44 and 56, and then add and subtract on another six to keep sort of going um, standard deviation by standard deviation. So 95% um, of our values lie between 38 and 62. Um, and then 99.7, almost all of our values lie between lie within three standard deviations. So negative three times six is minus 18. Positive three times six is positive 18. So um, we're gonna subtract the 18 from 50 to get 32 and add the 18 to get 68. And 99.7% of our values lie between um, 32 and 68 respectively. Okay, so again, you can just keep you know adding and subtracting the six on to go you know, an additional standard deviation from where you were before. Um, if you're going sort of one standard deviation at a time, but sometimes you just wanna know and you just jump to the whatever that is. Um, so another try it, suppose X has a normal distribution with a mean 25 and a standard deviation of five. Between what values of X do 68% of our values lie? So we wanna find out one standard deviation um, below and one standard deviation above that mean of 25. This one, you know, I go through that same math here. So kind of here's a picture of it with our mean of 25, and then this would be one standard deviation um, above, and here's one standard deviation below. Um, and basically we're subtracting five off and adding five on to get 20 and 30. So 68% of our data in this situation lie between 20 and 30 on our graph. Go another, Oh, I guess I don't go another standard deviation, but you would just keep adding and subtracting the five on here. The scores on a college entrance exam have an approximate normal distribution with a mean mu of 52 and a standard deviation of sigma equals 11 points. So this would be 52 and this would each one of these would represent another 11 points. This would be to the right above the mean. This would be to the left below the mean. So 68% are gonna lie um, within 11 units, one standard deviation from 52. So if you um, subtract it off, you're gonna get 41, add it on, you're gonna get 63. I did the math up here. So subtract the 11 to get 41, add the 11 to get 63. Those Z scores are negative one and positive one respectively for those values, 41 and 63. Do it again, subtract another 11, add another 11, or you could do two times the sigma. So that's what I did here. I took the mean of 52 minus two times sigma to get 30, and 52 plus two times 11 to get 74. So the value 30 has a z-score of negative two, the value 74 has a z-score of positive two, and 95% of our values lie between 30 and 74. And then 99.7, same thing, do it again with another 11. So 52 minus three times 11 gives us 19. 52 plus three times 11 gives us 85. So 19 has a z-score of negative three and 85 has a z-score of three. 99.7% of our values lie between 19 and 85 for the scores on this entrance exam. The playing life of a sunshine radio is normally distributed with a mean mu equal to 600 hours and a standard deviation of sigma equaling 100 hours. What is the probability that a radio selected at random will last from 600 to 700 hours? So here's a graph with our mean of 600 and each um, mark on our x-axis is one standard deviation away. So the probability that the playing life will be between 600 and 700 hours is equal to the percentage of the total area under the curve between 600 and 700. So since mu is 600 
and mu plus sigma is 600 plus 100 is 700, we see that this area is simply the area between mu and mu plus sigma. So here I've filled it in, so between 600 and 700, but that's just one half of one standard deviation away. So if this is 68% of our data, half of that is 34. So if we just go to the positive one standard deviation, that's half of 68 or 34% of the area. So the probability that a sunshine radio, a randomly selected sunshine radio will last between 600 and 700 hours is 34%. So we've seen this before. Um, if we have a population X with a stand, with a normal curve, excuse me, we can use the z-score transformation to get our standard normal curve. If we have a standard normal curve and we want to get the data values that we originally had, we use this formula. So sometimes that's called finding a raw score um, that using the X formula. So z-score times sigma plus mu. And um, here, Rod figures just takes an average of 17 minutes with a standard deviation of three minutes to drive from home, park the car, and walk to an early morning class. One day it took Rod 21 minutes to get to class. How many standard deviations from the average is that? Well, we know how to do that, right? We're going to use our z-score formula, and we're going to do 21 minus 17 divided by 3. So 4 over 3 is 1.33. So that's one and a third standard deviations above the mean. So that took longer. Obviously, we could tell that. Uh, what commuting time corresponds to a standard score of z equals negative 2.5? So now we have the z score, so we're going to work backwards to get the time it took. So z, negative 2.5, times sigma 3 plus mu 17 gives us 9.5 minutes. Can Rod count on making it to class in this amount of time or less? Well, commute times at or more than 2.5 standard deviations below the mean are rare. So, right, we know two standard deviations is 95% of our data. Three is 99.7. So to be that far out would be a pretty rare situation.